All right, folks, welcome back to the Hoplite channel. Um, if you notice the audio, it's uh, back on the shotgun mic. I was having some technical difficulties with the, uh, with the lapel mic, but nevertheless, uh, you have clicked on uh, Marcus Aurelius. This is uh, part one. Uh, for anybody who's new here, uh, welcome. And for those of you who are coming back, thanks for coming back. Um, we are starting now the last part of the three-part series I'm doing on the Stoic Titans. And uh, I saved, in my opinion, the best for last, Marcus Aurelius. Some people would agree with that. Um, so uh, in the first uh, part of the series, I started with Seneca, and then we moved on to Epictetus, and now we conclude with Marcus. So we're going to discuss um, uh, Marcus Aurelius' uh, brief um, uh, well, a brief bio on his life uh, right here really quick, and then we'll get into some readings of the meditations. And um, we'll talk about, you know, Marcus's uh, lasting impact on Stoic philosophy and why he was so um, uh, influential for the philosophy and um, how his particular brand uh, has really inspired many different people from all walks of life and how um, he has was able to condense many lessons in Stoicism to uh, digestible, readable uh, paragraphs that um, just as you read them, they, they just, you know, they flow. And I think that was just the way he had with words. He was that good. So uh, anyway, we'll begin with the bio on Marcus and uh, move on uh, with some readings. But he uh, was born uh, Marcus Aeneas Verus. That was a name he was uh, assigned, I guess you would say, because his father, Marcus Annius Verus II, had passed away, and he was raised by his, his grandfather for the most part uh, of, his, of his youth. But um, later, when he became emperor, his full name became Marcus Aurelius Antonius Augustus. Yeah, so imagine having that name and saying that every day. But uh, he was born in 121 AD in Rome, and he died in 180 AD in Vindabona, Austria. So his reign was March of 161 to March of 180. So that was the uh, second to last uh, reign in the Nerva Antonine dynasty. So he almost had about 20 years. And I guess if you look at you know the, the reign of, of these emperors, like a lot of people assumed it was over the course of a lifetime, but you know, Marcus's case, you have uh, just under 20 years. And in other cases, you would have someone who would have well over 40 years. But, uh, in any event, he had 20 years, just about 20 years, and he, uh, he made good use of that time, as we'll see. So um, he was born uh, Marcus Aeneas Verus, or that was the name he was given by his grandfather, to uh, a praetor, Marcus Aeneas Verus II. So he was born into the patrician class. He was born into upper class in Roman society, and he was born during the reign of Emperor Hadrian, so we know that much. And uh, he got his education under uh, two uh, well-known tutors at the time in Rome, uh, Atticus and Fronto. Um, and these tutors were, uh, they were assigned to uh, Marcus and other members of the upper class to uh, instruct children in the fundamentals, such as learning the Latin and Greek uh, alphabet, as well as the, the, uh, the languages, uh, studying mathematics, uh, sciences, uh, politics and um, things of that nature just you know the basic studies of what we considered elementary education but they remained his tutors um, you know into his early adult life as well so you're asking me well if he was born into uh, a, the upper class how how exactly did he come into being the Emperor of Rome so it's a little bit round about how we got there but uh, this is uh, what, what I was able to deduce in the timeline so Hadrian uh, didn't have uh, a son of his own, so he adopted a son. Uh, this son, unfortunately, died in 138 AD. So Hadrian decides to adopt Marcus's uncle, Antonia, Antonius Pius. So we know Marcus's father had passed away, so Marcus's uncle is adopted by Hadrian, and Hadrian himself ends up dying in 138 as well. So uh, Antonius Pius, being the presumptive heir, he becomes emperor right after Hadrian passes away. Okay, so some time goes by, and Marcus marries Antonius' daughter in 145 AD. You say, wait a second, um, if Antonius Pius is Marcus's cousin, and Marcus 
marries Antonius' daughter, it means he married his cousin, right? Yeah, he did. Mar Marcus Aurelius, brilliant mind. You know, this was a different time. This, this, was, not, this was not unheard of, but yeah, he married, he married his cousin. So anyway, he married his cousin in 145, and then Antonius Pius died in 161 AD, also without an heir. So his daughter, naturally being married to a man, it was the role now of Marcus to assume the role of his father-in-law, uncle, and Marcus Aurelius became, uh, became emperor. And uh, his reign began in March of 161. So uh, that's kind of how he end up, ended up becoming the, uh, the emperor of Rome. Uh, and this is an interesting time because um, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince, he considered this the age of the five good emperors. And that if you look back at Roman history, uh, a lot of people would say after the death of Nero and Claudius and, and Caligula, and all, Caligula all, that, all that nonsense, um, a new age of leadership came into Rome. And this was the age of the five good emperors. And that was uh, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, uh, Antonius, Pius, and of course, Marcus Aurelius. So those are the five good emperors. They were also called the adoptive emperors because um, I think without exception, everyone except Marcus adopted their heirs. Marcus, as we'll find out later, uh, had several children and his son Commodus goes on to become emperor after him. But everybody prior to Marcus had no, uh, you know, uh, sons, no, no issue from their own marriages. So they adopted their children to become the heirs to uh, the, the Roman Empire. And it's, it's thought that maybe perhaps this is why these uh, five emperors were considered the good emperors, because they didn't, in, they didn't pass down uh, the, the emperor's laurel, so to speak. They actually had to seek out an heir and to see if that person was of good enough quality to be that emperor. Whereas prior, maybe someone just had a son and they said, well, I just had a son. Don't know a thing about him. Don't know if he'll be good or if he'll be bad. But since he's my son, he's going to be emperor. And, uh, you know, with that, it was kind of a grab bag. But with the adoptive emperors, uh, the theory goes that they had to carefully select who would become the next ruler. And perhaps by doing this, they were able to give Rome five good emperors. Um, just a theory. Anyway, so you're asking, okay, it's fine. Um, how did Marcus Aurelius come to learn Stoicism? And that's a good question. Um, as we know, he was an intelligent young man, according to uh, his tutors, and he he knew that he was most likely destined for something great after he had risen to the upper class. He was, you know, he was being groomed or he was moving his life in that direction. So he wanted to know more about life than the simple studies like mathematics, like Latin and Greek, um, like, uh, like, you know, biology. He wanted to know things as they worked as a whole. So he had this inclination to learn philosophy. Um, his tutor, uh, Fronto, actually, was kind of like this old school, you know, uh, teacher who didn't, didn't endorse that at all. He, he's kind of like, you know, if you have someone had, uh, your, you know, your, your father kind of says to you, well, why do you mess around with this stuff? Uh, it's rock music, uh, or video games, uh, this nonsense. I mean, you know, uh, you know this, this is the stuff that kind of makes people into layabouts and daydreamers. This philosophy stuff will fill your head with, with gibberish and it's just, it's a waste of time. So Fronto uh, per tried to persuade Marcus that philosophy was a fool's errand to try to learn why bother yourself with this? It was just, um, you know, uh, a waste of time for a man who was going to be going into greatness. Marcus, uh, I'm sure he took his friend, uh, you know, in stride and said, that's fine, I, I understand your opinion, but I, I want to know more about life. And I think philosophy is where I, I will get those answers. And in particular, he, he sought out uh, a Stoic. And this is the man by the name of uh, Apollonius of uh, Chalcedon. Apollonius is actually mentioned in one of the first chapters of Book One of the Meditations, as is uh, the next guy I'm going to cover. But Apollonius, uh, 
you know, was a well-known Stoic at this time. He uh, gave a lot of source material to Marcus, uh, but more importantly, he introduced him uh, to the next Stoic who helped fo form uh, Marcus's um, passion for Stoicism, and that was a man by the name of Quintus Junius Rusticus. And he was considered the new Seneca. In his day and age, a lot of people in the, in the philosophical circles saw uh, Rusticus as the second coming of Seneca. And as we know from the, the first series on the Titans I did, Seneca was pretty much the first big name in Roman Stoicism. There were others, of course, but Seneca really, um, he was a rock star when it came to Stoicism in Rome. So if for Rusticus to be considered the next Seneca, you knew he was a big deal. And uh, Marcus also mentions Rusticus in his uh, first book of the Meditations. And he said, of all the people he'd met in his life, he always thanked God for the two men he met in Apollonius and Rusticus, because without them, he, doesn't, he, he didn't know how his life would have turned out. So he thanked them, or he thanked God, Zeus, for, um, for leading him down that path to meeting these two men and to learning Stoicism. Rusticus, uh, his, fa his grandfather actually um, was also a well-known Stoic philosopher, but had the misfortune of being um, in his prime during the reign of Emperor Domitian. And as we remember, uh, Domitian and Fronto were kind of of the same school of thought where philosophy was bad. Philosophy put stupid uh, ideas in the minds of stupid people, and the philosophers could gather the flocks of other students and philosophers around and perhaps move them against power, perhaps to get them to question too many things and they would be a threat to uh, the empire and to the emperor himself. So Domitian banished all philosophers from the city of Rome in 93. And we know in 93 AD, that was when Epictetus also had to leave Rome, but he sought his own school in Nicopolis, Greece and was able to continue teaching Stoicism there. Unfortunately for Rusticus, his, his grandfather was not so fortunate and ended up dying uh, in those times of persecution. But Rusticus, believing that his grandfather was correct and that Stoicism was still worth carrying on as a legacy, continued to teach it and took Marcus as his pupil, uh, just the same as Seneca's, uh, Seneca uh, taught Nero or attempted to teach Nero uh, to be a decent man through that uh, Stoic thought. Unfortunately for Seneca, it didn't work out in his favor. Fortunately for Rusticus, he gave us Marcus Aurelius. So sunrise, sunset, I suppose. Uh, anyway, um, we are going to read now uh, several passages from the meditation. I will provide a read-along as always so that uh, you can follow with me. This translation uh, is a little bit... Um, it's, uh, it's different. Uh, you, you just, it uses a lot of thee, thine, and thou, but uh, you'll get the gist of it. Uh, it's right here. And uh, yeah, so anger, mercy, revenge must be in, in your Stoic library uh, by Seneca. The Discourses, the Handbook, the Enchiridion by Epictetus must have in the Stoic library. But if your house is burning down and you can only grab one book on Stoicism, you got to grab the meditations. You should grab all of them because they're books. They should be that heavy, right? But if you can only find one and it's the meditations, you'll be okay. Um, and it's very short. I want to say this one is less than 125 pages. Different translations, but it's, it's less than 150 pages no matter what translation you go uh, and pick up. So absolutely, this should be in your hip pocket as a Stoic. If I see you on the street and you say, oh, hey, I'm a Stoic too. I'm going to say, where's your copy of Meditations? If you hand it over, I should open it up and I should see underlines, highlights, notes in the margins. That's how you know you're for real. Okay, so we'll begin with, um, this is in book two, and this is uh, chapter five, and it's entitled, well, it's, I'm sorry, it's not titled anything, it just, uh, it begins. Do nothing against thy will, nor contrary to the community, nor without a due examination, nor with reluctancy. Affect not to set out thy thoughts with curious, neat language. Be neither a great talker nor a great undertaker. Moreover, let God that is in thee rule over thee. Find that he hath to do with a man, an aged man, a sociable man, a Roman, a prince, one that hath ordered his life 
as one that expects, as it were, nothing but the sound of the trumpet, sounding a retreat to depart out of this life with all expedition, one who for his word or actions neither needs an oath nor any man to be a witness. So what he's saying there is that don't live your life with expectation. Don't live your life looking for anything but the call of the trumpet to take you home into death. Because no matter what you do, no matter where you go, you need to be your own man. And you should not worry about uh, what kind of life lies ahead of you. You must just worry about what kind of man you will be in that life. And you will need to swear no oath or have no man as your witness to say you lived a good life. Uh, your life is yours alone. And if you know your character, if you know your quality, and you carry that with you, that's all you need. And that was what was Marcus was saying in that chapter was, if that is all you have, count yourself lucky, because some people don't even have that. Some people can't say that their life is their own and that they need other people to bear witness to get quality or to get, um, I guess, validation out of life. Or they need to swear an oath and they need to have certain things happen for them to believe they are decent people uh, who do decent things. But if up here you leave a life of virtue and you can say that to yourself with confidence, then that is all that is all necessary for life. And as a Stoic, this is all we should uh, strive for. It's very simple. Okay, moving now to book four, chapter 10. He says, These two rules thou must have always in readiness. First, do nothing at all but what reason proceeding from the regal and supreme part shall, for the good and benefit of men, suggest to thee. And secondly, if any man that is present shall be able to rectify you or to turn you from some erroneous persuasion, that you be always ready to change your mind, and this change to proceed, not from any respect of any pleasure or credit thereon depending, but always from some probable apparent ground of justice, or of some public good, thereby to be furthered, or from some other such inducement. Okay, what is he saying there? So we just got done saying, listen, be your own man. If, if you're smart and you know how to read and comprehend and you understand that virtue is the only good, be your own man. You know, go your own way, do your own things. But if you are doing, if you were doing everything as though it proceeds from reason, you must also be reasonable when it comes to your failings. And if someone who is present sees you err and does so to correct you, you know, with justice in mind, you must also be willing to accept that correction. Uh, not to get credit or to uh, derive any pleasure, but from the ground of justice that it's in the public good for you to be corrected and also to correct when someone errs as it applies to reason to logos. So it's very interesting reading this from an emperor. Uh, he demonstrates a lot of humility here in saying that um, he tries to walk the righteous path of reason and justice, but he is never so much so above everyone that he cannot be corrected when he strays from that path. So as a Stoic, understand you must approach life, number one, with reason. And as a reasonable man, number two, never let yourself become above reason in that you cannot be corrected when you fail. Because as I said in the Epictetus, ser Epictetus series, we must understand we are not Zeus, we're fallible. And when we fail, uh, we should count ourselves lucky that someone there with reason can put us back on the right track. All right. This is the last one for this video. It's a short one. It's in the same book, chapter 14. Not as though had a thousand years to live. Death hangs over thee. Whilst yet you live, thou may be good. And that's simple. 
That's simply saying what Seneca was saying in that no one dies, right, wishing they had done more evil in the world. No sane person. Um, only those people who wish they had done more good live with that regret, right? So live as good as you can in this world as a man who is, you know, captain of his own ship, master of his own destiny, and understand that just as uh, Seneca said, before you can turn around after all this life has gone by you, death will be at your elbow before you even know it. And no one goes to the grave wishing they had done more harm, wishing they had given more pain, wishing they had uh, felt more jealousy, wishing they had uh, gotten even with that person one more time. Most people go to the grave wishing, I, I wish I hadn't done what I did uh, several years ago. I wish I had found that man who I wronged and made amends. And that's another thing too is uh, there's a story that um, Marcus Aurelius found uh, Stoicism uh, because of two reasons, and I'm sure there's more. But he actually heard a story about his uh, grandfather in the uh, imperial sense, Hadrian. Uh, he heard a story that Hadrian, who was considered one of the good emperors, one day flew into a rage over some issue and he grabbed a stylus, a pen, and this pen was either, you know, wood or metal, and he poked one of his slaves in the eye and put out his eye. And the slave is screaming and bleeding and, and just in agony and Hadrian drops the stylus his senses come back to him. He realizes he was overcome with rage and he picks the slave up who was a decent man who didn't deserve any of that and says, my God, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I need to make amends. How, how, can I, how, can I, how can I make this right? And the slave looked at him and just said, sire, I just want my eye back. Hadrian knew right then and there it, it, there was no going back. Here you had an emperor who could call forth legions and destroy cities. He could also call forth a multitude of men to build a city. But because of his rage, he took a stylus, a pen, and poked out his slave's eye. And all the slave wanted was his eye back and Hadrian couldn't give it to him. This was a lesson that I think Marcus took to heart and dove into Stoicism because he needed to find some philosophy that would let him rise above that anger, rise above those emotions, because I'm sure Hadrian went to his grave thinking perhaps about that slave who he had maimed and wishing that he could have stopped himself in that moment. If only he would have let reason been greater than his anger. And the second story was that Marcus Aurelius, like his father, also became a praetor, which was a ministerial uh, position in Rome. And in that society, the praetors often sat in judgment of uh, civil cases. And in several cases, uh, Marcus saw the uglier side of human beings. He saw people coming with, with uh, uh, claims against one another, with complaints, uh, with slights, with outright lies. But they, they came before the court no matter what. And he saw people trying to deceive one another. He saw greed. He saw uh, lust driving people to murder or, or, or revenge. And he also saw people come into the court and possibly try to deceive the judge, who was him. And he thought to himself, I need to find some philosophy. I need to find stoicism because right now I'm just a praetor. But if one day I rise to the position of emperor, imagine how many people will be coming into my court with their claims of this or their complaints of that and how often they will try to deceive me, knowing if they can convince me to use my power on their behalf, what evil I could wreak on the world. And I think those two reasons, uh, he embraced Stoicism the way he did, and he wrote down his daily meditations as a handbook for people to learn from uh, over the course of his life, the lessons that he took with him, and that how no one went to the grave wishing they had done more harm. Everyone who's decent or insane would probably go to the grave saying they wish they had done more good, they wish they had given more forgiveness, they wish they had shown more clemency to more people uh, than they had. Okay, 
Again, hopefully this audio is coming in decent. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, part one. This is part one of the part uh, three-part series I'll do for Marcus. Maybe part four. We'll see. Maybe if I'm feeling good, I, I'll do it for him. Uh, but anyway, I uh, appreciate everyone coming by. Uh, we'll pick up with part two. We'll do more from the meditations. And I will get more into Marcus Aurelius uh, as the man, as the emperor, and how just what a... Um, literally like a, a lottery the world kind of won having a man in this position of power who embraced this philosophy so vigorously and how he became uh, such a, uh, a a good ruler for other rulers to um, uh, to praise and perhaps uh, take uh, inspiration from anyway uh, thanks for coming by once again and uh, we'll see you in part two till then uh, take it easy